The Team Never Quit podcast is sponsored by Navy Federal Credit Union. When you use the Navy Federal Cash Rewards Card, you can earn up to 1.75% cash back on all purchases. Learn more at NavyFederal.org. What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Team Never Quit podcast. It is a great day. It's raining outside, but the weather is finally kind of chilling off here in Texas. Which I'm grateful for because last week it was like 80 still, which is insanity. It'll uh, probably be 80 tomorrow too. <laughs> probably, the weather shifts. Probably not. Probably not wrong. Patreon question today for you guys: What is a food that reminds you of childhood? Gumbo. Mine is gumbo. Mine is chips. <laughs> Good one. Cindy, y'all remember those Hungry Man dinners? They used oh. to come on the, yes. the, the foil the, the with microwave. The, t- with the microwave ones with yeah. the corn and the. Yeah. I see. I haven't seen one in forever, but if I see one of those. I almost <laughs> bought you one of those. Well, that'd be great. You would like that? <laughs> I've loved them. Really? Yeah, I thought they were really. Were they not good for you? Are they bad? <laughs> I think it's really bad for you. That's but... why they gave them to us. That's yeah. why our generation is different. That's right. <laughs> That's why she can climb mountains. <laughs> Well, well, actually, funny enough, I had two bags of chips, but please don't tell Michael. Okay. <laughs> oh, right. My, it's what I call breakfast casserole. Um, it's basically a crescent roll laid on the bottom, like Pillsbury crescent roll. Um, and then like I just mix eggs and sausage and just bake it. That sounds good. And it's really good. And the kids, yeah, the kids. That's, that always reminds me of you. Yeah. We're going to take a food break here in a minute, now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the kids love that. Yeah, our family makes something similar. that We call them like breakfast pinwheels. It's like croissant dough, breakfast sausage, chopped chives, and then you roll it into little pinwheels and uh-huh. just bake them. And that is so good. Manny does that. So yeah. good. Chicken and dumplings is always a good one. It reminds me of my childhood. Oh, you're going to go cinnamon there. Rolls. Yeah, cinnamon. cinnamon rolls. Oh, yum. I was actually talking to Addie because Addie does this now. When Hunter was really little and I had no time in the mornings, I would take a cup, like a to-go cup, and I would put his cereal in it with milk and give him a plastic spoon <laughs> and send him yep. off. To Still do school. that. <laughs> and I started doing that with Addie. <laughs> Axe doesn't like it, but Addie loves it. She's like, I need my to-go cup of cereal. That's Thanks fun. Yeah. All the time. <laughs> yeah. Do you, do you use that move now if you're full of the day? <laughs> I actually have not used that move in a long, long time. Right. But yeah. I kind of feel like I've got to get back to it. Yeah. yeah. It's a good grab and go. Yeah. It's perfect grab and go. Ramen is even good. I, maybe that's just like my, my pour coming out. But like. You know, be cordy ramen. Ramen, man, was so good. Yeah, that sounds good. No matter Our pantry where you come is from, full bro. of ramen. Nice. Like the cheap ramen. We had like frozen veggies now to try to like class it up a bit. But yeah. All right, let's it's, go. It's just still ramen. Yeah. All right, guys, check us out. Patreon.com slash Team Never Quit. You can ask your favorite questions. You can check out our exclusive community. It's a lot of fun. But let's get to the most important thing, which is our incredible guest. We've got a great guest for you guys, a former psychologist. Nelly Attar was born and such raised- a thing? I don't know. I feel like yeah, you can't can you be, be a former, former psychologist. I feel like you're always one, right? Once a psychologist, always a psychologist. Yes. That's an earned title. In 2017. Uh, <laughs> go ahead. I hope so. I mean, I, I wish. Uh, I just feel outdated. But um, sure, why not? <laughs> well, in 2017, she became the owner of Saudi Arabia's first dance studio, cultivating a culture of active lifestyle in the region, which also led her to win the Fitness Influencer of the Year Award. And she's got an amazing story. Nelly, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. I'm excited. I, I want to hear about this. Con- first of all, congratulations on everything that you accomplished. I mean, it's just it's just hard to 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 do all of that. Period. Where you come from, and I, I'd love to get into a, a little bit of all that. The way we start out here is, is a little bit about your backstory, though. I mean, how, how you got to here, where you come from. You got a couple of siblings, just to kind of give us an overview of that. Thank you so much. Um, so I'm Lebanese. I was born and raised in Riyadh, the capital city of Saudi Arabia. I spent my childhood here. Um, and then I went to university abroad. 
Um, I lived with my parents and I went to an international school. So back in the day, Saudi was quite conservative. We lived in like little bubbles. Um, but luckily enough, I had a great childhood and upbringing. And yeah, I, I'm, um, I, uh, I don't know what to say about my childhood, but um, I spent it mainly in the desert. I mean, Saudi is extremely hot. It's an it's a, it's a opposite weather conditions of what I do on mountains. Yeah, um, uh, right? <laughs> sure yes. is. I mean, how would you even talk about that if you don't mind what it's like to in Riyadh? Because when, when, if you've never been over there, pe most people don't leave the town they grew up in here. I mean, like a shocking number, over 50 something percent. To ex um, when you hear those names, they're synonymous with certain things, certain people, they, they don't ever get out of town. They won't know any different. But growing up over there, I mean, there's beautiful places everywhere, Riyadh especially. Um, so Riyadh is, um, what can I tell you about Riyadh? A couple of years ago, I mean, now it's, it's been going, it's been undergoing a lot of change. Um, in the last, I'd say about, it's about like, it's been five years that the country has been opening up significantly. Um, so women can drive now. We have a lot more entertainment activities prior to five, five to seven years ago, pretty much everything was segregated. So you only had female and male schools. Even within the restaurants, you had female and male section. Even weddings were segregated. You would have a female and male section. Um, and why, why do y'all do that? Why, why is it that way? Just to, if, if you don't mind um, me asking. It's just, I mean, it's it's been that way for so long. And this is what people are comfortable with. This is what people are used to. Um, so it comes from higher up. And, and this was the norm in the country. All right, check. But the country started to open up. And it's been amazing to see how quickly there's been a mindset shift. People are ready for this change. So now everything is mixed. Um, we even started to have mixed gyms. A couple of years ago, females didn't even have gym licensing. It wasn't a thing. So women couldn't, couldn't even own gyms. Um, so the landscape was completely different. You wouldn't find women training on the street. It was very taboo. Um, and a couple of years ago as well, it was mandatory for us to wear abaya, the traditional clothing, and we had to cover. And now that's all changed. Now it's no longer mandatory. Now you go on the in, in the streets in Saudi, you do see women running. You do see people cycling. Um, I was actually doing a bit of research to understand the sports landscape. In just a few years, I think it's about five years, the participation of female in sports has gone up by 100%. Oh, wow. It's crazy. Yeah, it's crazy. That's right. So um, when you yeah, were a kid, so, you weren't allowed to ride a bicycle or do any of those things? I mean, it was really difficult because you'd still have to wear the habaya and it would get caught in the chains of the bike. Um, so I did used to cycle. I used to train for triathlons about six, seven years ago, I would just have to go really far out into the desert, drive for about two hours to get to where we want to train. It wasn't always convenient. It's also quite warm for a majority of the year. It goes up to about 45 degrees Celsius. Um, so now it's our winter. It's about 25 degrees Celsius. It's going to drop little by little, but it, for, for majority of the time, it's quite warm. So it, it wasn't really convenient. Um, it was a bit scary as well because you don't find women training outdoors. So I just, I didn't feel very comfortable at the time. I would still do it anyways. Um, and what helps is that I am an expatriate. I am Arab, but I'm not Saudi. So that kind of helped. Um, explain yeah, that, explain what that means. Was, explain, could you explain yes. what that means, please? So I'm, I'm Lebanese. Lebanon is a different country. Right. Um, I am still Arab. And so Sa Saudi is an Arab country. Uh, Lebanon is an Arab country. But given that I'm not Saudi, the rules were not enforced on us as strictly. So if I do go out and I'm not covered, it wouldn't. I mean, the rules were not as strict with foreigners um, as they were with Saudis. But again, now it's changed. Now you don't even have to wear abaya. Now we have events. We have raves. We have concerts. So much has changed in the last few years. What was it's that amazing. like when it, when it first opened up? I mean, was it just like this huge celebration in the streets? Was there like a single day that was, was just like this grand opening of women could, could go out in the streets without their traditional clothing? No, they did it gradually, and it was very smart of them. They started to, um, there was something called Saudization, where companies were forced to recruit Saudis. 
because back in the day, majority of um, workers and staff were expatriates. Mm -hmm. So there was a really high number of unemployment amongst Saudis. So that kind of helped open up the society a little bit. It kind of forced women out of their houses. Um, it kind of forced women to be exposed. The second step was they started, they developed a sports landscape. So now there was an Olympic committee. Now they have a budget for sports for women. Then they launched female gym licensing. This was just in 2017. Wow. Um, so it was step by step. And then you started to see an influx of gyms opening up for women. Then they announced that women could drive. Then cinemas opened up. So it's been little by little. Um, oh, yeah. Because I used to have to go to Bahrain to drive, to learn how to drive. Right? The Saudi women? Uh, now they can learn how to drive here. Right, right. I, when I was there, one of the guys, when they would tell us, they were like, hey, you guys got to be careful out here because the Saudi women like to come here and learn how to drive. <laughs> that and was back in blur, Burning through there in their Ferraris and Lamborghinis and stuff, learn how to drive out. It was something. <laughs> oh, interesting. Probably, yeah, probably. I wouldn't be surprised. So uh, just, just out of curiosity, when, when you say Lebanese and Saudi, both Arab, Yes. Do, yes. Can you know know the difference immediately between someone who's from Lebanon and someone who's from Saudi Arabia? Of course, the accent is so different. It's an accent sure. thing, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And we look a bit different too. So yeah, you could tell. I mean, we all speak speak Arabic, but the the accents are a bit different. I mean, a lot different, not a bit different. Yeah. So, okay, so it's like being from America, but you're different from a different state. Yeah. Like no, it's like being from America and the UK. You both speak English, but very that. different. Okay, accents. check. That's that, thank you. That's what I needed to hear. Yeah. All right, that makes sense. The way you just explained that, I get that. All right, all right. How, how sports? Was mom or dad athletes? Uh, siblings? So just to let you know as well, sports was not not common in schools. Um, in Saudi, actually, just a couple of years ago, they listed Saudi as the least active country in the world. I think that was by Stanford University. This really? was just like five, five years ago. Um, yeah, sports was not available in a lot of schools. And if it was, it was not available to everyone, not all grades. Um, my dad was quite active. He loved the sports. He liked recreational sports, though. Like he liked his tennis with friends. He liked jogging in the morning. So Whenever we'd have weekend activities with the family, he'd take us out to the desert. We'd go hiking. And I remember these hikes vividly. I remember walking in the desert, him telling me about the bugs. And he would tell me, like, leave everything where it is. I, I still remember how I felt. I still remember these moments with him. All right, guys, switching gears for a moment. If you're 50 or older, you do not want to miss this. If you're listening to this Gerber Life Guaranteed Life Insurance Sponsorship ad, there's a good chance that you're alive. And if you're not, well, this may not be of interest to you. Now, I know what you're thinking. Life insurance? I'm going to live forever. Death is what happens to other people. Well, for the sake of argument, let's assume you're wrong and that someday you won't be listening to podcasts anymore. I know it's not easy to talk about, so I'll do the talking. If you're 50 plus and alive or 50 to 75 in New York, you can apply for Gerber Life Guaranteed Life Insurance with guaranteed acceptance regardless of your health. And since this life insurance is guaranteed, you don't have to get a medical exam. In fact, you don't even have to fill out a health questionnaire. For a free quote, just visit GerberLifeFamily.com. Then when you stop, I mean, if you stop listening to podcasts, your family can use the insurance money to help cover your final expenses or anything else. Your kids already inherited your ears, allergies, and questionable singing voice. Don't make them inherit your final expense tab too. See website for terms and restrictions. And then on my first climb, it was when I was 17 years old and he took me to Mount Kenya. He was living there at the time. So uh, that was the first year of university for me. He took me and it was a father-daughter uh, bonding trip. And he instilled those seeds for sports. Um, he taught me the importance of sports. How old? Yeah, How old? A freshman in You're college. Fresh, freshman in college. Uh -huh. All right. When that started well, on the walks and everything, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. And then in school as well, when we had sports, um, they put me in basketball. They would also make an effort to put me uh, in recreational activities outside of school, swimming. My dad was all for sports um, and activities and my mom, too. That's so awesome. All right. So, yeah. 
dealing with both of those, trying to, how'd you find your niche? What, what was it? What, what were you doing when you figured out this is the direction that I wanted to go? I still don't know where I want to go. That's a good answer. Still- <laughs> great, great answer. No, that's, that's, that's yeah, that's right. <laughs> So once once you started to be able to legally be able to do these things out in the street and everything, how did you get um, interested in being kind of a forefront of the of fitness for women in Saudi? Um, I was actually public way before. I've been public on my social media since 2012. And um, my social media account was Shake Your Jelly with Nelly. There you go. So it was a little bit, <laughs> <laughs> it was a little bit out there. That's funny. I But that was the reason why I got into sports professionally, um, because there wasn't a lot of, I mean, sports was not readily available for women. And when I I had just finished my master's degree and I moved back to Saudi on the basis that I'm going to work in therapy for about three to four years, um, leave Saudi to go study again. But during that time, I was like, what am I going to do after work? After working um, with patients, I needed an outlet And I also wanted to train with women. So that's how it started for me because it wasn't available. Um, And then I just started to spend more and more time in sports because honestly, there was not not much to do. There was nothing else to do. And uh, so then I started to be public on social media. I remember the day I went public because I'm like, I want to start to appeal to more women. I want to put the message out there. And that's how I started to get clients. And that's how my studio became known across the kingdom because from day one, we went public. That is so awesome. In 2012, did you get any backlash because yeah, how that worked? I'm just curious as this because you're you're groundbreaking on both, right? Mm-hmm. So you're an athlete, and, but you're trying to implement the athletics into the kingdom, which is mm-hmm. it's tough. But For slow women. is smooth, smooth is fast, right? You, you said it earlier that you don't you don't jam absolutely. that absolutely, okay, Jack. absolutely. And so I I always kept. I mean, it just the way it happened was I was always respectful of the uh, respectful of the culture. So when I'd post me running, I'd be wearing a uh, abaya running. Um, and then when I'd organize female runs, I think I organized the first Earth Hour run in the kingdom. Um, and we took a risk there because we weren't sure if it was OK. Um, I just gathered women. And I'm like, listen, if anything happens, we'll just disperse. It's OK. Let's get together. But everyone had to respect, you know, the rules of the kingdom. We had to wear the abayas. So that's how I did it, little by little, respecting the rules of the country, respecting also um, just the norms of the country. And so I think that's why there was such a great response. For the most part, there was a very positive response and people wanted to come on board. My aim was to inspire people. How am I going to inspire them if I don't speak their language? Um, So I, I started to have more and more people on board, which inspired me in turn to do more and more of this. And I mean, I did get backlash every now and then when I would take a little step forward. Oh, that's how you know um, you're making progress. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. And well, then, you know, I just have to remind myself that it'll be OK. Literally a week or two later, I'd forget about the incidents and things will be OK. Um, I've had to go private on my account several times as well with certain incidences. I'd go private, then public, private. But now everything's OK. I'm sure that's how you turn something large around. I mean, if a lot of times when people want to do something, they, they get in there and they get, they get so excited, they smash it into the face. But I mean, to run a kingdom and keep that thing going, there's so many parts that go into not only what you're doing, but the overall vibe of the whole place. Mm-hmm. That's what's shifting. Being on the forefront of that is is that's amazing. That's good work. Well, even being able to just inspire those women in the very beginning when you were doing the the private that first private run Think about those women have probably never gone out oh, by themselves sure scared to death, because yeah. they were too scared to do it. So, you know, there's power in numbers. Well, a lot of people watch you go through it first mm-hmm. and let you take that ass whipping. Yeah. They'll let you get out there and struggle just to see if you can get it done. <laughs> and then they'll Listen, come in. Honestly, a lot of the times I took the risk with the woman. I didn't know what it was going to be like. And they didn't know either. I was just open. I was honest. When they'd ask me, are you sure things are going to be OK? No. But That's- let's see. <laughs> Um, so I, you know, the, the key was we just try together. We don't have any expectations. If it works out amazing, we did something. And if it doesn't work out, we'll just go back home. And and this would be my mindset with a lot of the training sessions as well. Like if it works out amazing and I, yeah. And if it doesn't work out, it just doesn't work out. Come back home. Um, so as hard as it is to wake up at three or four in the morning to beat the sun, what was harder is 
no, not knowing if I'm able to train, you know, I don't know what it's going to be like. Are there going to be a lot of men on the streets today? Um, is it going to be safe for me to train? Yeah, so it's it was it was interesting. So once you get into one event, because it's obviously it's growing every time you turn around you, and you're pushing yourself to keep going and going. And it's same door shut in your face every time you move over and you got to start all over or as you progress through this. I mean, they got to be watching you. Mm -hmm. The kingdom. The king knows what's going on in his kingdom for sure. Yeah. And I'm, I'm grateful for the kingdom and the king because of all the opportunities I have today. And um, yeah, I know, like, like, I mean, every time I would stop, no, I wouldn't take a step back for sure. I mean, I've a lot of the times I've had to redirect. For example, with Move, when we started Move, it was everything. We weren't focused on dance. It was everything. Yeah. And then we focused on dance. We realized certain things are not working. We redirected. So... Um, I, I don't think that we take steps back. In fact, like whenever it doesn't work, we learn what doesn't work right. and we just take a different path. When did you realize um, into your, you were doing psychology, when did you realize you wanted to focus on fitness? Um, when I felt like I was creating more impact through sports and I started to feel like my work, my primary job was distracting me from sports. I remember that feeling and I'm like, that is not a good feeling. It's the other way around. Sports is starting to distract me from my primary job. This is like not okay. And then I remember thinking, fine, I'm going to work part-time in sports. It's no longer going to be on a freelance basis. I'm going to dedicate more time, but I'm never going to do this full-time because I have other things I want to do like therapy. Well, surely enough, a few years later, it became full-time. How that happened? So, just, just one love led to the other? One thing led to the other. Um, I started to teach more and more classes. Um, and then I diversified. So I started with dance fitness and then I got certified in CrossFit. Uh, I got certified in yeah, personal training. Yeah, that's how it starts right there. It's like a tattoo. You get one, it's kind of like you can't help it. Mm -hmm. One thing led up into where you start climbing. I, from the desert to climbing the mountains, huge difference. Mm -hmm. How'd you get that? Um, curiosity. I mean, I'm still interested in trying different things. Um, so it's, it's, it was curiosity. Um, I, I remember after my first drop, I went on a scuba diving expedition. I was the least experienced diver. Oh my God, I suffered. I got sick. We went all the way to the Maldives. Everyone was so excited. I didn't know what I was seeing or doing under the water, but I just threw myself in the deep end. I remember it was like 30 something dives in just a few days. Oh, wow. um, and then I did that on on my second holiday, I went to Kilimanjaro. I'm like, my second trip, I'm going to go in the deep end, go climb Kilimanjaro. <laughs> and that I loved. That I'm like, okay, that I really enjoyed. I want to do more of that. So, thank you. You're a firecracker. Yeah. I mean, talking about 30 dives. I'm like, and most people don't even knock those out in a couple of years, right? So, you're doing yeah. your, your down, your 30 bouncing, and then you're going over to Kilimanjaro. All right. Yeah. I got sick, though. <laughs> I did get sick. And you still did it. Most people, when they get sick, they leave, they bounce yeah. out. Seasick, especially seasickness, the worst. Freaking worst. Yeah, man. it is the worst. Yes, yes, it is the worst. I mean, seasickness is manageable. You can take pills. It's the sinuses that you can't really do anything about once, you know, like once you're diving, because then you can't equalize. Mm -mm. I had both. Oh, you got full benefits then. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Because that, that'll get you on the way down and the way up. The sinuses, when those yes. plug up, oh, yeah, that's the worst. What uh, made you want to do Kilimanjaro? <laughs> Um, I think after Mount Kenya, it just left an imprint in me. Although we didn't summit the mountain when I did it with my dad, it was just that feeling of being out in nature, doing something so challenging, so different. Also having come back, losing weight. I was just like, I like this whole thing all together and, and just the whole experience. So I wanted to try it again. Um, and when I decided to do Kilimanjaro, I was a bit fitter. I mean, I was already doing CrossFit. I was training quite a lot. And um, I wanted to go back to Africa. So I thought, okay, let's do this. Let's go climb the highest volcano in Africa. Um, and uh, it was amazing. I did it twice because of how much I loved it. Oh, my gosh. And Kilimanjaro was your first climb? Uh, Kenya was. Or Kenya, excuse me. Yeah. What, what was your most difficult? <laughs> I'd say K2. Yeah. Okay. All right. Explain that. Why? I was scared. I was so scared. I was terrified. Of what? The whole <laughs> everything. 
everything. I, it was just the atmosphere on the mountain. It's, um, I mean, yeah, it's, it's, it was tough. It was really tough. I think K2 is the toughest, but I suffered on other mountains more. So if you asked me back in the day, what was my hardest climb? It would have been a different response. Sure. Um, but now, like, I think the, the, the mountain that's in my recent, like most recent memory is K2. And it was just terrifying. I was terrified of dying. I was terrified of falling, terrified of rockfall. There was a lot of rockfall on K2. Um, from global warming and from the climbers. There was a lot of uh, climber-induced rockfall. Someone just hits a rock by mistake or steps on a loose rock. It creates a ripple effect. And if there's anyone below that, you know, below that person, it can kill you. Like if, if you get hit by the rock. All right, guys, Christmas is right around the corner. If you are stumped on what to get your hardest to shop for loved ones, don't panic. I want you guys to get comfortable with Tommy John's Wrap It Up sale going on right now. In Tommy John, you're that much more comfortable, so you can do anything and everything better. Shop Tommy John's Wrap It Up sale right now and give the gift of comfort to everyone on your list, including yourself. With over 18 million pairs sold, giving Tommy John has become a holiday tradition. 97% of women and men love getting a gift from Tommy John, and that's why Tommy John does not have customers customers. They have fanatics. I absolutely love wearing the cool cotton undershirts because I've tried a lot of undershirts and typically they're thick, they're hot, you sweat in them, they don't look good under a dress shirt and that's just not the case. These are two to three times cooler because their fabric is just so much amazing. It's moisture wicking, it's breathable. Seriously, you should definitely check it out for anyone on your Christmas list, maybe yourself too. Celebrate softness season with the gift of new Tommy John underwear, loungewear, and pajamas and every gift's backed by Tommy John's best pair you'll ever wear or it's free guarantee. Shop Tommy John's wrap it up sale and get 30% off everything at tommyjohn.com slash TNQ. Order now so your gifts arrive before the holidays. Guys, it's not too late, all right? You got to order now. 30% off at tommyjohn.com slash TNQ, tommyjohn.com slash TNQ. See site for details. And there were so many rocks on the route. And you just hear them. You hear them. It's like a helicopter. Yeah, the rock falls. So you, I mean, apart from having to climb this highly technical mountain that is a mixture of rock, snow, and ice throughout the terrain, like throughout the, the route, you have to dodge rocks as well. And dodging rocks means sometimes you have to run. Sometimes you have to turn your back and just pray that it, you know, it doesn't penetrate your bag. Even when we're sleeping in tents at Camp 1 and Camp 2, there's rock fall and the rocks can penetrate the tent. It's yeah, it's just terrifying. So wow. each one of the mountains when when you say they're different and, and you also talked about how like th there's a difference in suffering. Mm -hmm. Like some, some things are hard to do. Some things are, are painful to do. Yes, for sure. Each one of those mountains elicits a different response. Every mountain is different. Yeah. And then also the way your body responds to altitude, it changes. I feel I find that sometimes my body is better able to adapt to the altitude. Sometimes it suffers more. Um, so there's the fitness component. There's the altitude. There's also the weather. Um, yeah. So I mean, I, I did Lennon Peak in 2018, training for Everest, and I suffered a lot on that mountain. I didn't summit. I wasn't properly trained for it. I was doing a lot of triathlons, not enough uphill work. So I, I suffered a lot on that climb and then I got pretty bad altitude sickness. Didn't listen to my body. For three days, I was up at 6,000 meters above sea level. No food, no water. I was just um, stubborn and I wanted to give it a try. But then I learned and I'm like, you know what? I'm going to turn back. And lessons like this were invaluable. Lessons like this helped me climb Everest and then climb K2. So what are all of the mountains you've climbed so far? Do you remember? You want me to listen? 14 of them. I think we got, that's a lot. Yeah, there's a whole bunch of them. <laughs> Training for each lot. one of those mountains, when you come down, is it, is it, I've talked to some of the guys who, and the girls who climb, it's like each one sparks the other. Mm -hmm. And then if one gets to you and you back off of it, there's nothing wrong with that. 
because the mountain's still there, so the, so will the climb. It's just the attitude of, of getting back in there and doing it. It's supposed to kick your ass. I, I think that's the whole point why some of us get into that. And that, uh, I mean, you're a psychologist too. That that's I can't even imagine what that does to you. Because after you analyze that and, and, and turn that back around, the lessons that you learn from going up the mountain are, are that, that sucker teaches you something. Even if you're trying, I've had my ass whipped on a mountain so many times and it taught me more lessons than anything. Mm-hmm. Them suckers, man. Cool. Yes, I agree. Um, and, and we're there for the challenge. Absolutely. If it's not a challenge, then why am I there? If I know I can do it, why am I there? Why would I train so hard if I know I can do it? It's that, you know, it's, it's all the unknown that make it what it is, that give it that spark. Yeah. That's really incredible that you did that. And being the first um, Arab woman to summit K2, what was that feeling like? I think one of the best feelings in the world. Um, I um, One of the best feelings because I made it safely. I made it and and I felt super strong. There were a lot of climbers up on the way to the summit that day. And that was really terrifying, just seeing the number of people moving up on K2. And we managed to cut and cut and cut the traffic, which was, I mean, just moving up on K2 on summit really? night is hard enough. Yeah, really. I, I, go ahead. Talk yeah. about that. Yeah. So like you'd have to clip around people. And I wanted to do that because if I felt strong, if I still felt like I had enough reserve, I don't want to be delayed. I don't want to be slowed down because um, I know how dangerous it is up there. I don't, I don't, we don't know what's going to happen. I was worried the Serac would fall or crack or, you know, worse. Like what if the ground beneath us cracks because there's so many people moving up on K2. And, you know, when we're moving up, sometimes I'd actually feel the ground shaking. I felt like I just didn't feel like the snow was just sturdy enough. And I was thinking, like, maybe K2 has never had this many people on it. What if it all collapses? I don't know. So I just wanted to, I was moving so fast that I lost my guide for an hour and a half. Wow. I didn't even realize. I was just in a state of flow. I was actually thinking of my dad. Um, may he rest in peace. I was thinking of him the whole time. Um, I was just thinking of my country as well, because at that point I realized now it's no longer about me. That's what I was going to ask it, you. I was like, okay, so when you're going through all that, and when that hard stuff hits, that's when you got to hit to the mental Rolodex. You're like, all right, why am I up here doing this? And that's what came oh, yes. to you is your dad and your country, right? My dad, I kept thinking, I'm Nelly Muhammad Attar. I'm Muhammad's daughter. If anyone can do this, it's me. These are the things that my dad used to love. And I know he's with me. And it's crazy because I've never felt this strong on any climb, especially on that day. Like after having gone through big days, you know, back to back, I didn't realize that I didn't think I'd perform this well on the summit. And I just felt incredibly strong thinking of my dad, my family, that this is for them. I don't care to be the first. I care to make it safely. But I know my family would be so happy if I did make history. And now it's no longer about my family as well. It's about my country that's struggling and suffering. Yeah. Lebanon is going through, a, you know, just a, so many political and economical issues at the moment. And um, there were other Arabs on K2 this season, by the way. I wasn't the first to climb. I was the first to summit. Mm -hmm. So it was only then at that moment that I realized I could make history if I made it first, um, in which I did. So the closer I got, the faster I got to the summit. And um, I remember everyone was struggling. My guides were telling me to slow down. My guide was like, this is not a race. (laughs) And I was like, "Mm, okay. (laughs) And And then, yeah, I was just thinking like, this is the moment. I trained for this. Mike, my God, Mike just... It just it destroyed my body with training. And this is why, for that day, for that moment. And I thought of everything. I thought of my life. I thought of why I do what I do. This will give me even more, um, like it will amplify my voice in terms of spreading movement and inspiring women in the region to do sports, especially especially where I live. So all these positive things kept coming in my mind, tried to filter out the negative, got a panic attack, Oh, good um, for you. Nice. Yeah, th- those come in handy, too, when you're up there. <laughs> yes, I got a panic attack on the on the blue ice. Um, there was a, a body hanging there as well, which was very unsettling. Um, and I just I didn't know how to climb on blue ice. I, I've never done blue ice before, so I just had to learn right there and then. And I kept falling and slipping. 
And then I almost slipped into a crevasse. And this was just a few hundred meters away from the summit. And uh, at that point, I got a full blown panic attack. But then I was like, breathe. You got this. Ignore everyone. Ignore everything. You got this. Got my breath. And then I managed to move up again. And then, yeah, continue to think of all these amazing things. So when you get to the top, how long do you get to stay up there? We stayed an hour. Oh, nice. Um, since we were the first group to arrive, we just stayed for an hour up until other groups started to arrive. And then we left. What's that like sitting up there seeing that? Well, we arrived so early. So it was 3 a.m. We saw nothing. It was pitch black. You're climbing um, at night. That changes things yeah. a lot, especially in the blue ice. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But I actually made peace with that. I was thinking of, um, I was thinking of the possibility of us arriving super early if we move fast. And I thought if if that meant we're going to be in in safer hands, then I'm happy to do that. I'm just happy to go at the pace that I'm able to move at. So yeah, we arrived arrived at three thirty in the morning. Um, I, I saw the flags. I saw that little like cliff. Obviously, tried not to move past the cliff. Uh, we took pictures. I cried for about 30 minutes. I was crying and crying and crying and crying, trying to digest it all. Was it clear, clear uh, skies? Could you see the stars? Clear stars. What are the stars like up there? They looked so close. They're amazing, right? Amazing, of course. And it was we were we were blessed with really good weather. That's awesome. Uh, yeah, like there was no wind, zero wind. You don't have any idea what stars look like here in America. You can't see them like you can over there. <laughs> There's a couple of places overseas where I can't see them here. Yeah. can't see them here either. Man, but when you when you're somewhere when there's no when you, that's all you can see, you can't believe how many are up there. Did that's you so actually speaking of stars, when I was trying to when I was trying to um, cut the queue and move between people, I kept looking at the lights and I'm like, okay, that's you know I'm, I'm going to move towards those lights. I'm going to cut through these people, move to these people. And then at some point I saw lights and I'm like, oh my God, why isn't this light getting closer? Why am I so slow? It turns out it was the stars. Yeah. Wow. Oh, wow. I thought it was people. Yeah. But it, that's how vertical K2 is. I just couldn't tell the difference between headlights and the stars. Oh my gosh. When you were up yeah. at the summit, did you feel your dad's presence? I did. I felt his presence the whole way through. It's weird. It's crazy. Um, I honestly felt his presence the whole way through. And I feel the reason why I was so strong, the reason why I stayed safe was because of him. Oh, that's so sweet. Dads and their daughters. Yes. You know how it is. All right. On the way down, what's coming down like? Horrendous. <laughs> it is, right? Um, it's worse. It's, yeah, it's a lot worse. I mean, you're tired and... When we were moving down, everyone was moving up. And the priority obviously goes to the people moving up. Right. So we would have to wait a lot of the times. Um, next to the blue ice, we waited for 45 minutes. Just, you know, allowing people to pass. And it was, you know, a bit of a shit show, sorry. But it was no, like a, a bit of a mess trying to navigate through people and making sure everyone stays safe. Because you never want to come off the rope. You never want to be unclipped. And everyone's still moving on the same line. So uh, it took it took actually quite a while to get down, and I was afraid of running out of oxygen. Are you carrying tanks? I was just carrying that one tank, um, and we thought that it would last because we were moving so fast on the way up. We assumed that it would be okay on the way down, oh, sure, but it yeah. took quite a while for us to get down. All right, guys, let's take a second to thank our sponsors over at Athletic Greens. You guys know I've talked about them before. This is a product we use every single day around here. I started taking this stuff because I was looking to get some better gut health. I've got a messed up stomach half since I was a baby, needed to do something about it, all right? The other thing I was looking for was a way to clear the medicine cabinet. I was tired of taking a thousand different things. I'm really not sure what was for what. This really streamed like that entire process. So if you have never heard me talk about it, this is your first time, or maybe you skip past this sometime and you're, and you're looking to be adventurous today. With one delicious scoop of Athletic Greens, you're absorbing 75 high quality vitamins, minerals, whole food source superfoods, probiotics, and adaptogens, which are all gonna help to 
start your day right. This special blend of ingredients supports your gut health, your nervous system, your immune system, your energy, recovery, focus, aging, all of the things. I'm telling you guys, I needed to do this because my stomach was just jacked up. I take it every morning. Sometimes I just do it with the water. Sometimes I mix it into a protein shake. Just depends on how I'm feeling. I love the fact that it's something you can easily travel with. It really is just a game changer when it comes to your health. And the fact that the Athletic Greens founder was experiencing gut health issues and ended up on this complicated supplement routine to recover. It was costing over 100 a day and this is why he created it. I always can trust a business where the owner experienced the same pain point and he found a resolution for it. So if you want to try them out, right now is the time to reclaim your health and arm your immune system with convenient daily nutrition, especially heading into the flu and cold season. It's just one scoop and a cup of water every day. That's it. Seriously, no need for a million different pills and supplements to look out for your health. And to make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you guys a free one-year supply of immune supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you need to do is head over to athleticgreens.com slash TNQ. Again, that is athleticgreens.com slash TNQ to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional engine. What time of the year was that? It was on July 22 this year. Oh, wow. It just happened. It just happened. And you know what's funny? So on February 2nd, so 0202, I turned 32 this year. And then we summited K2 on July 22. Wow. 22 has a lot, a lot of power. Yeah. Which one's the hard, so. which one, your, your most difficult peak on the climb? Like any run into problems in, on any of them? Um, I mean, Everest, when I climbed Everest in 2019, it was the year that there was a lot of traffic. Uh, so we, we, a lot of people got sick, uh, several people passed away along the way. So that was terrifying because we got stuck in the traffic jam, that huge line that you saw. Yeah. How long do you have to sit there to, at base camp before you even start going up? We're we talking months. No, no, not months. So with Everest, what we what we do is we hike up to base camp. It takes about seven days. Um, and then once we get to base camp, we spend a couple of days there just to allow our bodies to acclimatize. We do some training, um, like technical training, so that we can move up. A couple of days later, we move up, and then we do the rotations. So we go from base camp to camp one, camp two, come back down. And that's that takes a few days. Then we rest at camp uh, base camp again for a few days then we move up again base camp camp one camp two camp three come back down that takes about a week rest at base camp for four to five days and then move up for the summit rotation so everest took uh 57 days almost two months k2 just took five weeks because we only did two rotations we didn't do three how many people in a camp can go up at a time i mean what, they, they just I stack that thing experience- full as many people as you can I mean, what I witnessed on K2 on Everest, to my luck, most people move up at the same time. Really? Yeah, because on Everest, we were not very lucky with the weather window. We had a very short weather window. We only had two days the entire season, which meant that like 500 people were moving up at the same time. Um, K2, the weather was bad for two weeks. We remained at base camp for two weeks. As soon as the weather cleared, everyone moved up because we don't know if you know, when the weather is going to change again and if there's going to be another window. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So with all these accomplishments, what was it like um, getting approached by Nike or getting to be, you know, a representative? Yeah, yeah. when that stuff women, started kicking in, yeah, yeah right, that's like, what I want to hear. That, were what your, was that like? Where you are influencing not only other women across the world, but especially in the kingdom that have been forbidden for so long, for so long. And I mean, you're being this inspiration for them. I wouldn't say forbidden. I'll just say it wasn't common at all. Okay. Um, and so with Nike, oh, I actually signed with them great. in 2016. Sorry. sorry. That's a great way to say that for as, as opposed to being against the rules as being forbidden as just not doing it. As yeah, it hadn't been done yeah. before. That, that, yeah. It's I didn't even think about it like that. Not- yeah, it's just not the norm. Um, certain things were, you know, not allowed, but for the most part, it was just frowned upon because people didn't do it. Um, so I signed with Nike in 2016, and that was one of the reasons why I started to delve into sports more, because they came across Shake Your Jelly with Nelly account, and they're like, oh, 
you know we want to support you and what you're doing with women so it just after like i think it was a few weeks of conversation with them conversations with them they sent me to amsterdam um and then i uh, went to the nike village in hilversum in europe and i was the like the only person from the middle east at the time and i was just i couldn't believe it i was in disbelief i'm like really is this me am i here <laughs> why like it, i'm I, like it can't be it's I'm, it's too good to be true um and yeah so i've i've been working with them since on and off um i've worked with them as a coach i led nike running and i led the nike training club here and we tried out different things because we didn't know what would work um and then i worked with them as an athlete as a supported athlete and till now i still work with them on and off um because you know nike is lifestyle versus mountaineering and most of what i do now in sports is mountaineering so um i work with them mainly on project on a project basis now mm -hmm. that's so awesome it's just so yeah and it's that, amazing yeah that you Sorry. get to be this inspiration even if it i use the wrong word with forbidden but even with it not being common your influence is making it common for women so it's got to start somewhere yeah i think that's really neat i mean it has to start somewhere of course i hope so um and just like most women here, I mean, I was raised here. There's no, nothing different. I wasn't born a mountaineer. I, I still don't know what I want to do in life. I'm still figuring it out. Uh, and I, I just, I feel like if there's one thing that I do consistently right is I take the risk, whether it's through move, whether it's through changing jobs, climbing. And life is short. You, If you're curious about something, take the risk. Right. Huh. It's your life. It's a great well, I guess, uh, I guess there's some yeah. trouble over here. <laughs> <laughs> we, we tend to be like that. Too. Yeah, right. Yeah. So in uh, in the future, uh, family, married, still going on. Oh, am I married at the moment? Yeah. I don't know. We're asking. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no, no, I'm not married. I wouldn't be able to do what I do, I think, at this intensity. Uh, no, no, I'm not married. Do I want to get married? Yes. Inshallah. I would love to one day. Um, yeah, God and willing. Have a family. Looks, yeah. Yes. So keep going. In the future, yeah. what do you, where, where are we going with this? Climbing all the peaks? I mean, if you're, you're the mountaineering side to bring all of this to the Middle East, mm -hmm. that's where do you plan on uh, stopping? I mean, of course, I want to continue to climb. Um, I also do want to focus on work and community initiatives. It's a balance that I have to find. So because when I'm away, I'm away. When I'm away, I'm away for a while. I'm sorry, but with the psychology and the way and you're overall going in and not only just talking the talk, but you walk the walk like you actually accomplished that to come back, open that up for all the women in Saudi and, and just over in the Middle East to perpetuate that that whole kind of realm opening up. I mean, it's an entire world. When do you stop doing your athletic stuff? When do you make that change? To where a full time. I don't want to stop. I know you do. I get that. <laughs> Never stop, right? Never yes, quit. Never quit. Never, never quit. stop. And I always tell everyone, you don't stop training because you age. You age because you stop training and you stop playing. Oh, well, so stop, I don't all right, you can stop, stop tape training. right there. This should just dropped all the knowledge we yeah. need right there. You want one of those <laughs> life examples? What were we talking about earlier? Life quotes? Say that again. <laughs> that was a good one. Yes. It, it's honestly, so there, there's this um, gentleman. His name is Bruno. He's been training with me. And I'm so grateful for him. I met him in one of the races that we had in Saudi a couple of years ago. And he volunteered to help me train for Everest because I needed someone to take me to the desert and bring me back. It was at the time that women couldn't drive. And so then he would come and train with me as well. He's 72 years old. Oh, wow. And he's stronger than most 30-year-olds and 20-year-olds that I know. And he trained for me. And he trained with me for K2 as well. I'd go to the highest peak in Saudi, which is in the south of Saudi, and you travel with me, climb the peak with me, whether I'm doing it at 1 a.m., 12 a.m., if I'm fasting, not fasting. It's amazing how resilient, adaptive, strong this man is. And that's what I want to be at 72. Wow, that's awesome. Are you still friends with him? Of course. <laughs> Bruno, if you hear this, you're the best. <laughs> that's awesome. So how can people that are listening support you and what you're doing? um just move move more i mean you would be supporting everyone you'd be helping yourself most importantly um 
If you have any questions, please reach out to me. I'm happy to help. If you have any questions about climbing, dancing, movement in general, and um, come to the Middle East, come visit us. Is it, so what is that? I actually just talked to somebody the other day that said that um, Saudi Arabia is a great travel destination now, which Americans would have never picked that for. <laughs> I can't believe what it looks like over there. For, I know, yeah. but like, I mean, other than Marcus was in the military, so he saw it, but for regular civilians in, in America, it's just not something that we think about. But I heard that it's really beautiful and that it's safe for travel now. And it's really opened and revi it just like almost revolutionized over there. It's true with all the changes, um, they've also opened up tourism. So we have a lot of natural destinations in Saudi, a lot of natural sites that were actually closed off before. Um, we have the Red Sea, beautiful areas in the Red Sea, just like Egypt, but in Saudi, they're not polluted. They're not, they're just fresh, pristine. And the way Saudi is trying to develop its tourism landscape, it's trying to keep sustain sustainability at the forefront. So in, in building resorts and um, developing hotels, uh, you know, sites for tour tourists, um, just setting up the whole infrastructure, sustainability is at the forefront. So I definitely recommend that you guys come and visit, see what the culture is like, because it's in that transitional phase at the moment. Yeah. You'll get a lot of history, but you also get a bit of like modern Saudi. That's awesome. Well, I actually had a lot of fun over there with the Saudis and everybody else. I'm Almost sure cost me my career. I'm so sure if, I can't did. imagine what it's like over there now. <laughs> I've had a blast. Oh yeah. Well, I, I can have some fun with y'all. <laughs> where were you? For, where were you in Saudi? For for sure. I, that, that's all right. Okay. I don't think he can say. <laughs> He was I was in this, thumbing around oh, with the yeah. He was in the special operations uh, unit, and I was in Saudi. Yeah. Just say it like that. Yeah. Okay. It's a good time. Okay, okay. I had okay. a great time. That's what I'm saying. That's probably why I had a good time because of who I was running around with. But um, is that your wow. your your saying? Just move. That's that's perfect. That that I describes think, your life. Just move. I think that's her. Is that your fitness studio? Is that your fit, is that the name of it? Just move. <laughs> move is the move is the dance studio. Okay. okay. The dance studio. Yeah, that's good. Yes, nice. Okay, so how can people find you on Instagram? Is it still Shake Your Jelly with Nelly? No, no. Thank <laughs> God. No, it's uh, it's my name and my surname. So it's Nelly Atar. Okay. Nelly, like rapper, and then A W T A R. Okay. Well, thank you so much for uh, for coming on and sharing your story with us and with our listeners. And everybody, go follow her because she's just so cute. Yeah, never stop. Keep yeah. moving. Thank Never you so moving. much, Nelly. Thank you. Thank you. Never stop. Keep moving. Come visit us in the Middle East, Saudi, Lebanon, the UAE. You guys will have a blast. Yes. All right. Thank God you. bless you. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, Thank Nelly. you so much for having me. Bye. -bye.